Good evening. Tonight's story is Lon Diorig and the Night of Terrible Valley. This story was documented by Jeremiah Curtin as told to him by an Irish peasant, and first published in 1894. In this humorous story, hero Lon Diorig performs ever more impressive feats of strength, cleverness, and determination in order to avenge his father and win the princess. Like many Irish folktales, it has wonderfully clever dialogue and interesting turns of phrase. A few of the turns of phrase are, in fact, so interesting that they are incomprehensible. <laughs> it doesn't reduce my enjoyment of the story, but if anyone could help clarify some of the terms in the comments below, that would be fantastic. So now, let's open our imaginations and begin. There was a king in his own time in Erin, and he went hunting one day. The king met a man whose head was out through his cap, whose elbows and knees were out through his clothing, and whose toes were out through his shoes. The man went up to the king, gave him a blow on the face, and drove three teeth from his mouth. The same blow put the king's head in the dirt. When he rose from the earth, the king went back to his castle and lay down sick and sorrowful. The king had three sons, and their names were Ur, Arthur, and Londiarig. The three were at school that day and came home in the evening. The father sighed when the sons were coming in. "'What is wrong with our father?' asked the eldest. "'Your father is sick in his bed,' said the mother. The three sons went to their father and asked what was on him. A strong man that I met today gave me a blow in the face, put my head in the dirt, and knocked three teeth from my mouth. What would you do to him if you met him? asked the father of the eldest son. If I met that man, replied Ur, I would make four parts of him between four horses. You are my son, said the king. What would you do if you met him? asked he then, as he turned to the second son. If I had a grip on that man, I would burn him between four fires. "'You, too, are my son. And what would you do?' asked the king of Londiarig. "'If I met that man, I would do my best against him, and he might not stand long before me.' "'You are not my son. I would not lose lands or property on you,' said the father. "'You must go from me, and leave this tomorrow.' On the following morning the three brothers rose with the dawn, the order was given Londiaric to leave the castle and make his own way for himself. The other two brothers were going to travel the world to know could they find the man who had injured their father. Londiaric lingered outside till he saw the two, and they going off by themselves. "'It is a strange thing,' said he, "'for two men of high degree to go travelling without a servant.' "'We need no one,' said Ur. "'Company wouldn't harm us,' said Arthur." The two let Londiar go with them as a serving boy, and set out to find the man who had struck down their father. They spent all that day walking, and came late to a house where one woman was living. She shook hands with Ur and Arthur and greeted them. Londiar she kissed and welcomed, calling him son of the King of Erin. "'It is a strange thing to shake hands with the elder and kiss the younger,' said Ur. "'That is a story to tell,' said the woman." the same as if your death were in it. They made three parts of that night. The first part they spent in conversation, the second in telling tales, the third in eating and drinking, with sound sleep and sweet slumber. As early as the day dawned next morning, the old woman was up and had food for the young men. When the three had eaten, she spoke to Ur, and this is what she asked of him. "'What was it that drove you from home, and what brought you to this place?' A champion met my father and took three teeth from him and put his head in the dirt. I am looking for that man to find him alive or dead. That was the green knight from Terrible Valley. He is the man who took the three teeth from your father. I am three hundred years living in this place, and there is not a year of the three hundred in which three hundred heroes, fresh, young, and noble, have not passed on the way to Terrible Valley, and never have I seen one coming back, and each of them had the look of a man better than you. And now, where are you going, Arthur? I am on the same journey with my brother. Where are you going, Landiaric? I am going with these as a servant, said Landiaric. 
God's help to you, it's bad clothing that's on your body, said the woman. And now I will speak to Ur. A day and a year since a champion passed this way. He wore a suit as good as was ever above ground. I had a daughter sewing there in the open window. He came outside, put a finger under her girdle and took her with him. Her father followed straight away to save her, but I have never seen daughter nor father from that day to this. That man was the green knight of Terrible Valley. He is better than all the men that could stand on a field a mile length and a mile in breadth. If you'll take my advice, you'll turn back and go home to your father. Tis how she vexed Ur with this talk, and he made vow to himself to go on. When Ur did not agree to turn home, the woman said to Londiorg, Go back to my chamber. You'll find in it the apparel of a hero. He went back, and there was not a bit of the apparel he did not go into with the spring. You may be able to do something now, said the woman, when Londiorg came to the front. Go back to my chamber, and search through all the old swords. You'll find one at the bottom. Take that. He found the old sword, and at the first shake that he gave he knocked seven barrels of rust out of it. After the second shake it was as bright as when made. "'You may be able to do well with that,' said the woman. "'Go out now to that stable abroad, and take the slim white steed that is in it. The one will never stop nor halt any place till he brings you to the eastern world. If you like, take these two men behind you. If not, let them walk, but I think it is useless for you to have them at all with you.' Londiarg went out to the stable, took the slim white steed, mounted, rode out to the front, and, catching the two brothers, planted them on the horse behind him. "'Now, Londiarg," said the woman, "'this horse will never stop till he stands in the little white meadow in the eastern world. When he stops, you'll come down and cut the turf under his beautiful right front foot.' The horse started from the door, and at every leap he crossed seven hills and valleys, seven castles with villages, acres, roods, and odd perches. He could overtake the whirlwind before him seven hundred times before the whirlwind behind him could overtake him once. Early in the afternoon of the next day he was in the eastern world. When he dismounted, Londiara cut the sod from under the foot of the slim white steed in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and terrible valley was down under him there. What he did next was to tighten the reins on the neck of the steed and let him go home. Now, said Londiara to his brothers, which would you rather be doing, making a basket or twisting gads? We would rather be making a basket. Our help is among ourselves, answered they. Ur and Arthur went at the basket, and Londiarig at twisting the gads. When Londiarig came to the opening with the gads all twisted and made into one, they hadn't the ribs of the basket in the ground yet. Ha, oh, then, haven't you anything done but that? Stop your mouth, said Ur, or we'll make a mortar of your head in the next stone. To be kind to one another is the best for us, said Londiarig. I'll make the basket. When they'd been putting one rod in the basket, he had the basket finished. "'Oh, brother,' said they, "'you are a quick workman.' They had not called him brother since they left home till that moment. "'Who will go in the basket now?' said Londiarig, when it was finished and the gad tied to it. "'Who but me?' said Ur. "'I am sure, brothers, if I see anything to frighten me, you'll draw me up.' "'We will,' said the other two. He went in, but had not gone far when he cried to pull him up again. By my father, and the tooth of my father, and by all that is in Erin, dead or alive, I would not give one other sight in Terrible Valley, he cried, when he stepped out of the basket. Who will go now? said Londiarg. Who will go but me? answered Arthur. Whatever length Ur went, Arthur didn't go the half of it. By my father, and the tooth of my father, I wouldn't give another look at Terrible Valley for all that's in Erin, dead or alive. I will go now, said Londiarig, and as I put no foul play on you, I hope you'll not put foul play on me. We will not indeed, said they. Whatever length the other two went, Londiarig didn't go the half of it till he stepped out of the basket and went down on his own feet. It was not far he had travelled in Terrible Valley when he met seven hundred heroes guarding the country. In what place here has the green king his castle? asked he of the seven hundred. "'What sort of a sprison goat or sheep from Erin are you?' asked they. 
If we had a hold of you, the two arms of me, that's a question you would not put a second time. But if we haven't you, we'll not be so long. They faced Londayarig then and attacked him, but he went through them like a hawk or raven through small birds. He made a heap of their feet, a heap of their heads, and a castle of their arms. After that he went his way walking, and had not gone far when he came to a spring. I think I'll have a drink before I go further, thought he. With that he stooped down and took a drink of the water. When he had drunk, he lay on the ground and fell asleep. Now, there wasn't a morning that the lady in the Green Knight's castle didn't wash in the water of that spring, and she sent a maid for the water each time. Whatever part of the day it was when Lon fell asleep, he was sleeping in the morning when the girl came. She thought it was dead the man was, and she was so in dread of him that she would not come near the spring for a long time. At last she saw he was asleep, and then she took the water. Her mistress was complaining of her for being so long. "'Do not blame me,' said the maid. "'I am sure that if it was yourself that was in my place, you'd not come back so soon.' "'How so?' asked the lady. "'The finest hero that ever a woman laid eyes on is sleeping at the spring.' "'That's a thing that cannot be till Londe Arega comes to the age of a hero. "'When that time comes, he'll be sleeping at the spring.' "'He's in it now,' said the girl. "'The lady did not stop to get any drop of the water on herself, "'but ran quickly from the castle. "'When she came to the spring, she roused Londiaric. "'If she found him lying, she left him standing. "'She smothered him with kisses, drowned him with tears, "'dried him with garments of fine silk and with her own hair. "'Herself and himself locked arms and walked into the castle of the Green Knight. "'After that, they were inviting each other with the best food and entertainment "'till the middle of the following day.' Then the lady said, "'When the Green Knight bore me away from my father and mother, he brought me straight to this castle, but I put him under bonds not to marry me for seven years and a day, and he cannot. Still, I must serve him. When he goes fouling, he spends three days away and the next three days at home. This is the day for him to come back and for me to prepare his dinner. There is no stir that you or I have made here today, but that brass head beyond there will tell of it.' "'It is equal to you what it tells,' said Londiaric. "'Only make ready a clean, long chamber for me.' She did so, and he went back into it. Herself rose up then to prepare dinner for the green knight. When he came, she welcomed him as every day. She left his food down before him, and he sat to take his dinner. He was sitting with a knife and fork in his hand when the brass head spoke. "'I thought when I saw you taking food and drink with your wife that you had the blood of a man in you.' If you could see that sprison of a goat or sheep out of air and taken meat and drink with her all day, what would you do? Oh, my suffering and sorrow, cried the knight. I'll never take another bite or sup till I eat some of his liver and heart. Let three hundred heroes, fresh and young, go back and bring his heart to me with the liver and lights till I eat them. The three hundred heroes went, and hardly were they behind in the chamber when Londayarig had them all dead in one heap. "'He must have some exercise to delay my men, they are so long away,' said the knight. "'Let three hundred more heroes go for his heart, with the liver and lights, and bring them here to me.' The second three hundred went, and as they were entering the chamber, Londayarg was making a heap of them, till the last one was inside, where there were two heaps. "'I have some way of coaxing my men to delay,' said the knight. "'Do you go now, three hundred of my savage hirelings, and bring him.' The three hundred savage hirelings went, and Londayarig let every man of them enter before he raised a hand. Then he caught the bulkiest of them all by the two ankles, and began to wallop the others with him, and he walloped them all till he drove the life out of the two hundred and ninety-nine. The bulkiest one was worn to the shin-bones that Londayarig held in his two hands. The green knight, who thought that Londayarig was coaxing the men, called out then, "'Come down, my men, and take dinner!' "'I'll be with you,' said Londayarig, "'and have the best food in the house, "'and I'll have the best bed in the house. "'God be not good to you for it, either.' "'He went down to the green knight "'and took the food from before him "'and put it before himself. "'Then he took the lady and set her on his own knee, "'and she and he went on eating. "'After dinner he put his finger under her girdle "'and took her to the best chamber in the castle "'and stood on guard upon it until morning. "'Before dawn the lady said to Londayarig, if the Green Knight strikes the pole of combat first, he'll win the day. If you strike first, you'll win, if you do what I tell you. 
The Green Knight has so much enchantment that if he sees it going against him in the battle, he'll rise like a fog in the air, come down in the same form, strike you, and make a green stone of you. When you yourself and himself are going out to fight in the morning, cut a sod a perch long in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You'll leave the sod on the next little hillock you meet. When the Green Knight is coming down and is ready to strike, give him a blow with a sod. You'll make a green stone of him. As early as the dawn, Londayarg rose and struck the pole of combat. The blow that he gave did not leave calf, foal, lamb, kid, or child waiting for birth without turning them five times to the left and five times to the right. "'What do you want?' asked the knight. "'All that's in your kingdom to be against me the first quarter of the day, and yourself the second quarter.' "'You have not left in the kingdom now but myself, and it is early enough for you that I'll be at you.' The knight faced him, and they went at each other and fought till late in the day. The battle was strong against Londayarg when the lady stood in the door of the castle. "'Increase on your blows and increase on your courage!' cried she. "'There is no woman here but myself to wail over you or to stretch you before burial.' When the knight heard the voice, he rose in the air like a lump of fog. As he was coming down, Londayarg struck him with the sod on the right side of his breast and made a green stone of him. The lady rushed out then, and whatever welcome she had for Londayarg the first time, she had twice as much now. Herself and himself went into the castle and spent that night very comfortably. In the morning they rose early and collected all the gold, utensils, and treasures. Londayarg found the three teeth of his father in a pocket of the green knight and took them. He and the lady brought all the riches to where the basket was. If I send up this beautiful lady, thought Londayarg, she may be taken from me by my brothers. If I remain below with her, she may be taken from me by the people here. He put her in the basket, and she gave him a ring so they might know each other if they met. He shook the gad, and she rose in the basket. When Ur saw the basket, he thought, What's above, let it be above, and what's below, let it stay where it is. I'll have you for a wife ever for myself, said he to the lady. I put you under bonds, said she, not to lay a hand on me for a day and three years. That itself would not be long, even if twice the time, said Ur. The two brothers started home with the lady. On the way, Ur found the head of an old horse with teeth in it, and took them, saying, These will be my father's three teeth. They travelled on and reached home at last. Ur would not have left a tooth in his father's mouth trying to put in the three that he had brought, but his father stopped him. Londiarig, left in Terrible Valley, began to walk around for himself. He had been walking but one day, when whom should he meet but the lad's short clothes, and he saluted him. "'By what way can I leave Terrible Valley?' asked Londiarig. "'If I had a grip on you, that's what you wouldn't ask me a second time,' said short clothes. "'If you haven't touched me, you will before you're much older. "'If you do, you'll not treat me as you did all my people and my master.' "'I'll do worse to you than I did to them,' said Londayarig. "'They caught each other then, one grip under the arm and one on the shoulder. "'Tis not long they were wrestling when Londayarig had short clothes on the earth, "'and he gave him the five thin tyings, dear and tight. "'You are the best hero I have ever met,' said short clothes. "'Give me quarter for my soul, spare me. "'What I did not tell you of my own will, I must tell you in spite of myself.' "'It's as easy for me to loosen you as to tie you,' said Londayarig and he freed him. "'Since you are not dead now,' said Shortclothes, "'there is no death allotted to you. I'll find a way for you to leave Terrible Valley. Go, and take that old bridle hanging there beyond, and shake it. Whatever beast comes and puts its head into the bridle will carry you.' Londayarg shook the bridle, and a dirty, shaggy little foal came and put its head in the bridle. Londayarg mounted, dropped the reins on the foal's neck, and let him take his own choice of roads. The foal brought Londayarg out by another way to the upper world, and took him to Aaron. Londayarg stopped some distance from his father's castle, and knocked at the house of an old weaver. "'Who are you?' asked the old man. "'I am a weaver,' said Londayarg. "'What can you do?' "'I can spin for twelve and twist for twelve. "'This is a very good man,' said the old weaver to his sons. "'Let us try him.' The work they had been doing for a year he had done in one hour. 
When dinner was over, the old man began to wash and shave, and his two sons began to do the same. "'Why is this?' asked Londiarek. "'Haven't you heard that Ur, son of the king, is to marry tonight the woman that he took from the green knight of Terrible Valley?' "'I have not,' said Londiarek. "'As all are going to the wedding, I suppose I may go without offence.' "'Oh, you may,' said the weaver. "'There will be a hundred thousand welcomes before you.' "'Are there any linen sheets within?' "'There are,' said the weaver. "'It is well to have bags ready for yourself and two sons.' The weaver made bags for the three very quickly. They went to the wedding. Londayarig put what dinner was on the first table into the weaver's bag, and he sent the old man home with it. The food of the second table he put in the eldest son's bag, filled the second son's bag from the third table, and sent the two home. The complaint went to Ur that an impudent stranger was taking all the food. "'It is not right to turn any man away,' said the bridegroom. "'But if that stranger does not mind, he will be thrown out of the castle.' "'Let me look on the face of the disturber,' said the bride. "'Go and bring the fellow who is troubling the guests,' said Ur to the servants. Londiarig was brought right away and stood before the bride, who filled a glass with wine and gave it to him. Londiarig drank half the wine and then dropped in the ring which the lady had given him in Terrible Valley. When the bride took the glass again, the ring went of itself with one leap onto her finger. She knew then who was standing before her. "'This is the man who conquered the Green Knight and saved me from Terrible Valley,' said she to the King of Erin. "'This is Londayarek, your son.' Londayarek took out the three teeth and put them in his father's mouth. They fitted there perfectly and grew into their old place. The king was satisfied, and as the lady would marry no man but Londayarek, he was the bridegroom. "'I must give you a present,' said the bride to the queen." "'Here is a beautiful scarf which you are to wear as a girdle this evening.' The queen put the scarf around her waist. "'Tell me now,' said the bride to the queen, "'who was Ur's father? "'What father could he have but his own father, the king of Erin? "'Titan scarf,' said the bride. That moment the queen thought her head was in the sky and the lower half of her body down deep in the earth. "'Oh, my grief and my woe!' cried the queen." Answer my question in truth, and the scarf will stop squeezing you. Who was Ur's father? The gardener, said the queen. Whose son is Arthur? The king's son. Titan scarf, said the bride. If the queen suffered before, she suffered twice as much this time, and screamed for help. Answer me truly, and you'll be without pain. If not, death will be on you this minute. Whose son is Arthur? The swine herds. Who is the king's son? The king has no son but Londiarek. Tighten the scarf. The scarf did not tighten, and if the queen had been commanding it a day and a year, it would not have tightened, for the queen told the truth that time. When the wedding was over, the king gave Londiarek half his kingdom and made Ur and Arthur his servants. I can't tell if my favorite part of this story is the part where the king gets knocked down by a shabby stranger and is so upset about it that he goes to bed and won't get up again, or if it's Landayarig using one guy to bludgeon 300 other guys to death until there's nothing left but bare shin bones. I also love how economically this story is told, these pithy little sentences that paint fantastic pictures. I also love how these characters say exactly what they are thinking every single moment. The interaction with short clothes is so funny. It's a pity we don't know the name of the person who related this story, or the name of the translator who helped Jeremiah Curtin document it. Although Curtin was multilingual, it seems he did use a translator during his visits to Ireland, where he collected and documented folklore. Jeremiah Curtin was an American ethnographer and folklorist. His early career was based on his skills as a translator, and he taught German in New York before becoming secretary to the U.S. minister to the Russian court. Eventually, he became a field researcher, documenting the customs and mythologies of several Native American tribes. In the meantime, he and his wife traveled around the world, studying languages and folklore, and he published history, mythology, and translations from Ireland, Native America, Mongolia, Slavic languages, and more. After his death, his family published his memoirs in 1940. 
Controversially, later analysis has proven that those memoirs were almost entirely written by his wife, Alma Cardell Curtin. And further analysis has caused a lot of people to suspect that she was actually the author of several of the books that were attributed to him. The title image this week is based on the beautiful title image in the Irish fairy book where I got this story. Uh, naturally, I wanted to track down a few more pictures just to keep the video interesting this week. So I went poking around in illustrations for Gawain and the Green Knight, um, since there's a lot of correspondence, but I won't be doing that story on this channel. I found an edition of that story with these gorgeous illustrations by someone named Frederick Lawrence, and I really liked the pictures, but they didn't quite fit, and I wasn't sure whether I wanted to use them. Then I couldn't find anything else about this Frederick Lawrence guy. He did one picture for a book on Norse mythology, and he did the illustrated capitals for a version of Beowulf, but he doesn't have a Wikipedia page even, and I can't find anything else about him. So I decided to use his drawings after all, because they are wonderful, and I don't want to forget him, and that is on theme for this channel. If you listen all the way to the end of the video, I make a little confession out here. Uh, this week's confession is that this video is a little bit late because my apartment building has suddenly become incredibly noisy. Uh, my building isn't very well insulated, my apartment is small, it's close to the door and close to the hallway, and my new neighbor has two young sons. And the noise of that family kind of coming and going up and down the stairs and then going into their apartment where it doesn't sound like they have carpet or furniture or anything yet. <laughs> it's catastrophic. So it's always noisy around here, but that's kind of exceptional. So I'm trying to kind of learn their schedule so I can record around it. In the meantime, I hope you liked this story. I hope you come back next week. This is Restored Lore, where we find weird old tales and try to introduce them to new audiences. Every week there's a new story, and if you subscribe and click the notification bell, you'll never miss a tale. Good night.